beginning at verse number 5. 1 Samuel, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse number five, for a passage to speak from for just a few minutes this morning. Give you an opportunity to turn there, or it'll also, or it's also available on our, on, uh, on our screen. We'll be reading from the New King, King James Version. If you have a version that's, that's, uh, that's different, that's, that's okay. Uh, if it's way different, you might want to check with us after church <laughs> and see, see what you're reading. Uh, uh, 1 Samuel, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse number five, it reads like this. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as below Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone. And set it up between Mizpah and Shin, and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. I want to speak for, from this thought this morning, and it is simply our Ebenezer moment. Our Ebenezer moment. Father, we are so thankful for your grace, Lord. We're so, so thankful for what you've done, for what you're doing, for what you're about to do in our midst, Lord. We look to you, Lord Jesus, and we ask that you open our hearts, Lord God, that you may speak to us, that you open our lives, Lord God, that you may change us, that you open, Lord Jesus, the path before us, that you might lead us, Lord God. And we're so thankful for what you've done, for what you're doing and for who you are in Jesus' glorious and wonderful name we ask it. Amen and amen. Often in the word of God, I, real, I noticed a pattern. I saw something that time and time again God does when he leads his people to the threshold of change. When he leads them to the threshold of great promise. When he leads them to the threshold of great uh, uh, purpose that was about to open in their lives. I noticed that God seemed to do something that this old boy thought was kind of odd. You see, God didn't take his people oftentimes to the brink of what he was about to do and then swing wide the, swing wide the door and say, go for it. He didn't just simply send them there and say, embrace the promises. He didn't simply just sit there and said, okay, do what I told you to do. Now, oftentimes I realized that God had a tendency to mash the pause button right before a great change. He mashed the pause button right before a great period of, of uh, a great season for his people. You remember the 40 years in the wilderness? God's people wandered around. They found themselves, they found themselves uh, uh, dropping like flies at times. They found themselves struggling to make it through 40 years. But after 40 years, God didn't say, run in, rush in. God didn't say, just, just do your thing, grab the hold of the promises of God. But no, Joshua took his people over the Jordan River and when he got to the other side of the Jordan River he didn't say okay it's time to go march on Jericho no he told them when you get to the other side God has instructed us that we need to do a few things first that we need to pause a while that there are certain truths that God need to establish in our lives there are certain things that we need to confirm in our hearts and our minds and say yes to before we step into what is next in our life and our heart Jesus Christ ascended on high and, he, and it still echoed in the hearts and the minds of the disciples. As they stood and they heard him, they remembered the words of what he said. 
He said, go into the other most parts of the world and, and, and teach them what I taught you. To observe what I taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And know that I am with you always, even until the end. But he didn't set them loose with that message. He said, no, but first go to Jerusalem and tarry a while. Uh, you, there needs to be a pause in your, in your experience before you experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Before you experience the unleashing of the church upon the city of Jerusalem and the miracles that was going to follow. He said there must be a pause that takes place in your life first. Now it was tempting the, the last few weeks as I began to prepare my messages for you and begin to seek God's direction on it. I wanted to jump right in. I did. I wanted, I wanted a six part, eight part sermon series, you know, just to kick it off and, the, and, and, and go strong. But every time I prayed, every time I came to the Lord, I kept hearing one word and it was the word Ebenezer. It was the word Ebenezer. And as I began to seek that out and as I began to find out what that meant, I come to realize that that Ebenezer that he was talking about was one of those moments that God paused his people before he unleashed them into a new season. Before he unleashed them to what God has in store for them. You see, if we're not careful, we will miss the moments that God has for our life. If we're not careful, we'll miss those times that God has ordained and anointed for our lives because I believe that before God wants to work through us, oftentimes he wants to work in us. That before God oftentimes will unleash us to our new d direction and new destiny, he wants to establish certain truths and certain facts in our hearts and our minds. And as I begin to seek the Lord and began to ask God what he wanted to, to say to us. He kept directing me to this one passage. He kept directing me to this passage where we see Samuel in one such moment that he has. Probably one of the unique, most unique situations that you could find yourself in was what the children of Israel had found themselves in. 20 years had passed since they had seen God move. 20 years had passed since they had seen anything take place in their life. They had lived for 20 years and in the wake of the most devastating loss they'd ever experienced at the hands of the Philistine, 4,000 men fell on the battlefield. And somebody in, the, in, in all their wisdom, I guess you could say, said, what we need is the Ark of the Covenant. Let's just bring this out here. And they brought out the Ark of the Covenant and surely enough, the priests were slaughtered and the Ark of the Covenant was taken into captivity by the Philistines. Those jokers would quickly learn that that was not a good move. They would quickly learn that you can defeat God's people sometime, but you can never defeat their God. And, and, and as he, as he, as, as he, hysterically, if you want to read a comedy in the Word of God, you read what happened in Dagon's temple. You read what happened in that in that land before they finally said, "Okay, put that thing on a cart, send it back over to them. It's their problem now. I don't want to have any part in it." But it had been 20 years since all that had happened. And now God's people, under the oppression of the Philistines, begin to cry out to God. They begin to repent and they begin to say, Lord, we want you in charge again. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here was Samuel. Samuel, there was no mention of Samuel for 20 years. He steps back onto the scene. And in stepping back onto the scene, he, be, he declares to them, we need a prayer meeting. We need to gather together. We need a time of repentance. We need a time to, uh, to declare God's goodness and mercy over us. And as he did that, as he began to, as he began to teach them and show them that, uh, he, he, he made a crazy, crazy suggestion. He said, we need to go to the Valley of Mizpah. Now, you know, might not realize the significance of Mizpah. Mizpah was the very battleground that 4,000 men had died in some 20 years earlier. It's the very battleground where the Ark of the Covenant had been taken and had been, and had been captured into the hands of the enemy. He said, we need to go there. And they're like, are you sure, Samuel? <laughs> you know, if we gather in the, in the battleground field, the Philistines going to see it as an act of aggression. They're going to see it as something that, that, that was lining up a battle or lining up a war. And he said, let's, let's go. So they took off down there. And sure enough, as soon as they got set up, as soon as they began to fast and pour out the water and begin to repent before God, the Philistines caught wind of it. And they decided that they're going to march on Israel. They're going to put them in their place. You know, sometimes that fight that you've been fighting, that battle that you thought was all in 
in the devil's hands. Let me tell you, I believe sometimes God sets up the fight. I believe that sometimes God starts it so that he can be our victory, so that he can be our strength, so that he can be the mighty God in the midst of it all. So, so they, they begin to, to hear word of the Philistines marching on them. So they turned to Samuel in the middle of this field and they said, don't stop praying, brother. Don't stop praying. You need, we need God to move on our behalf. And Samuel didn't seem to be in a hurry at all. He builds this altar before the Lord and the Bible says he took a suckling lamb a young lamb and he offers it blood upon the altar and then turns it into a burnt offering before God and he turns around the Bible says uh, and, he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he and he prays to the Lord and the Lord hears them now I want you to notice what happened next because too often we overlook the significance of certain points in the word of God what happened in next in this passage was the Bible said and hear the words that he said that the Lord thundered not that thunder happened not that lightning went across but that the Lord happened there came a sound from the very throne room of God there came a sound from the very throne from, from the very from the heavens like nothing they had ever heard like nothing they'd ever experienced like nothing they've ever known it was so traumatizing that it would be etched into the minds of the Philistines so much so that for, for years they would not step inside the children of Israel's property or the children of Israel's place. God's thundering. The Bible said it caused confusion. This same Hebrew word confusion was the word that was used of the Egyptians when they found themselves in the middle of the Red Sea with walls of water surrounding them. And all of a sudden the water began to close. What was it he saying? He was saying it was traumatizing. It traumatized the Philistines so much so that it would completely terrorize and turn them around. God, the Bible says, and I love this phrase, the Bible said that the Lord defeated before Israel. Not by Israel, but before Israel. God defeated these enemies. And after this great victory... After they, in a day's time, regained all the territory, all the territory that they had lost to the Philistines, they turned around and they looked at Samuel and Samuel said, not so quick, guys. It's time for a moment with God. It's time to pause before we rush into the blessings, before we rush into what God has for us, before we rush into what God wants in our lives. It's, it's time for us to understand and to recognize that we need and what we need is an Ebenezer moment. The Bible said that he called for a memorial to be made. It was a stone that was rolled out. And he had the, the, the word etched on this stone, Ebenezer. Which in the Hebrew means stone of help. And, and he turned around and he added a little something to that meaning. He said, he said thus far has the Lord helped us. Thus far has the Lord poured into our lives and our hearts. You see what, what Samuel was calling for. Is he, was, he, was calling for a, a, he was calling for a moment in their lives and a moment in their times where they stop. And they mark what God has done for them already. That they stop and they mark where they are. Uh, that God has brought them. And they stop and with confidence look forward to what God has in, in store for them. Could you give me some water, sweetie? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh. I created a, that I can create a confusion myself right there. But he said there needs to be a moment, an Ebenezer moment, that we stop to look behind us to see where God has brought us to. There needs to be an Ebenezer moment where we look at our lives and say, I am where I am today because of where God has brought me from. There needs to be an Ebenezer moment in our lives where we with hope, with we with faith, look forward to what is ahead of us. Why? Because we know what has been behind us. We know what God has already done in our lives and in, in our hearts. This morning, thank you, sweetie. All that singing. <laughs> but this morning I'm, I'm calling for this church 
to make today their Ebenezer moment. To make today the day that they say, Lord God, I want to stop long enough to remember who brought me where you brought me. I want to stop long enough to remember, Lord God, all the good things that you've done for me and how you brought me to the point that I'm at now. And Lord Jesus, with faith, look forward to what you're going to do again. Oh, Derek, how can you be so sure that God's going to bless the Open Bible Church in Freeport? Because he blessed you yesterday. He blessed you last year. He blessed you 10 years ago. He blessed you 70 years ago by that same faithful one that watched over us. He's going to still watch over us today. He's going to still provide for our every need and every, every heart. So I want you to notice some things that we can learn in our Ebenezer moment this morning. First of all, we need to realize that this is our time to acknowledge for acknowledgement. This is our time to acknowledge God in our life. Now, if you are a student of the Old Testament, you realize that the patriarchs of old, such as Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, as they walk through the desolate wilderness and they walk through these desolate places, you notice something. They leave behind them two things. They don't leave great cities. They don't leave great kingdoms. They leave two things behind them, altars and memorials. Now, their memorials are very different from our memorials. Our memorials uh, mark events. If you've ever seen a war memorial or something that, that stood out, it marks an event that took place. Sometimes it marks a person, uh, such as a, 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 a celebrity or, or a hero in our past. It, sometimes it marks a specific date in our life. But I am so thankful that these guys all mark the very same thing. If you notice, they always marked the character and the nature of God. They, they, they wanted it to be re realized and remembered by everyone around about. It's not about what I've done. It's not about where I came from. It's not about who passed through here. It's about God is still God and God is still on the throne. You see, in the, you see in the word of God, you see Moses come to, the, to the, the better waters of Marah and God turns it sweet and he brings healing to those that are sick. And he sets up a memorial, the Bible says, and he says, Jehovah Jireh it is. You are the God that heals us. The angel of the Lord stopped the hand of Isaac, I mean, of, 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 of Abraham as he raised his knife above his head to plunge into the heart of Isaac. But the angel stopped him before he could do that. And he said, look around you. And he looked around and he saw a ram that was caught in the thicket. And I like what this man of God did. This man of God said, no, he's not, the memorial isn't going to be a stone. It's going to be the mountain. I'm going to call the entire mountain Jehovah Jireh. So the everyone that sees it will realize one important thing. He is always the provider. He is always the one that has given to me. Oh, it's in my heart's desire this very day that this congregation, this house of the Lord would not be marked as a memorial to our denomination, would not be marked as a memorial to anyone's giftings, anyone's abilities, anyone's talents. But oh, it is my prayer, Father, that this place be marked as a memorial to the very character and the very nature of Almighty God. That when people think of this place, they'll think that's where I can meet a living God. If people think of this place, they think that's where I can experience what God has for me. That's where I can hear the very word of God in our midst. Oh, let me tell you, I want to be involved in that time, in that place in my life where I can acknowledge who He is and what He is. You see, he was the sacrifice lamb on that field that day. I don't think it was a mistake that Samuel picked the lamb to sacrifice at such a crucial time. I believe God left him to do that. Why? Because as we know, how many of you know the Old Testament is a shadow of the new? And if you don't understand the new, you can't really understand the old. Because it's all just pointing toward Calvary. It's all just pointing toward. And when he, when he sacrificed that lamb that day, he was instilling in the hearts of the Old Testament believers that our victory is contingent upon the blood that was spilt at this altar. Let me tell you, our victory is not contingent upon what we have in the bank. Our victory is not contingent upon uh, the, the beautiful facilities that we have. Our victory is 
not contingent upon anyone that stands in this pulpit or behind this pulpit. Our victory is contingent on one thing. The blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you and shed for me on Calvary's tree. And that is the most powerful thing that we can experience in our life. Let me assure you this morning, that blood will be preached from this pulpit. Let me assure you this morning, that blood will be called upon. Let me assure you this morning, that we will stand and believe. That I, it doesn't matter to me who doesn't believe it in this city. It doesn't matter who doesn't preach it in this city. As far as this church is concerned, I rely on the blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ. And we can stand firmly on that fact. Because the Bible tells us in Revelations that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. He's also our stone of help. I like what Samuel said. He, he declared this Ebenezer our stone of help. But as we were talking this morning, uh, some of the men, I want you to notice what they did. They didn't just sit back and say, go get them, Lord. Go get them. Sick them. Sick them. But as soon as they started seeing God moved, they moved. They chased these Philistines out of the borders that they had ruled for, for, for years. They chased them away of, uh, uh, and, and they reestablished their place with replacing God. And why is that significant, Derek? Because they were fasting. They were weak. They had been wailing and repenting and crying out to God. So I believe as they chased after the enemies, as they chased after those that, that, that had persecuted them for so long, that they felt the unction and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit as they pursued them. And let me tell you, I believe that when we start acknowledging God and we start saying, you, you Lord, is the one that's driving this ship. You, Lord, is the one that's leading us. God will call us on board as well. God will say, I want to use you. I, I want to work through you. I want to bless your life and your heart. I told somebody the other day, I said, I've come to realize something. My Lord loves to take his children to work with him. Have you ever taken your kid to work with you? Oh, that's a wasted day. Seemingly production-wise, you don't can't seem to get a whole lot done. You can't seem to, you can't seem to, to uh, but you realize it's important. You realize it's significant. You realize that he that 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 you need to teach and instill some things. Let me tell you something that you, it might surprise you. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need me to do what he's going, going to do. But let me tell you, whenever somebody steps up and say, here I am, Lord, use me, God will use you. Why? Because it's the way he prefers to work. It's the way throughout the ages he prefers to move. If you let him, he'll be your help. If you let him, he'll use you in ways that you can never imagine. If you let him, he'll be your Ebenezer. Oh, and it is my heart's desire this morning for this church to gain that reputation again and again as it always has. That that is a church that God is helping. That is a church that is following him and in pursuing him. They've experienced what God has for their life. It's also, he's also that enduring stone. What do you mean, Derek? I'm glad that, that he did not make a tree the memorial. He did not make a scroll of paper the memorial. He did not make any of these things a memorial. He wanted to put it on something that would outlast him. He wanted to put it on something that generations to come could walk in that battlefield that day and read that mark Ebenezer and realize God is still our help. It's been thousands of years since that event took place. But I'm here to declare to you this morning, God is still the Ebenezer. He is still our help in time of need. He is still the one that has control of our heart and our lives. Alan Shepard was the first American astronaut. Anybody ever heard of Alan Shepard? Alan Shepard uh, went into space and during, before he went into space, the, the, the reporters gathered around him and one reporter asked a profound question. He said, what do you trust most that will take you into space and to bring you back? Is it the controls? Is it the, the, the capsule? Uh, what is it? Is, it? is it ground control? What is it that you trust most to have a successful voyage? And he said, well, it might surprise you. But what I trust most is that the, the laws of God is absolute. He said, it doesn't matter what my dials say. If the laws of God was not absolute, if gravity just did its own thing, if everything uh, in, in space 
just acted in his own way, in his own accordance. He said, I never make it home safe. I never make it, but because the laws of God is absolute and unchanging, he said, I can rest on the fact that I can make it home safely. You serve a God that is absolute. You serve a God that is immutable. You serve a God that doesn't change. You serve a God that whether you're faithful or not, he's still faithful. Whether you, whether he, you serve a God that will make a way where there is is no way. Why? Because he is that rock that never changes. How can you be so absolutely sure? Because I'm standing on the rock Christ Jesus that is absolutely sure and will never bend and will never bow. Oh I'm so thankful for what he has done for us. I'm so thankful for that rock in our life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to jump a little further ahead. Uh, there Eric. I got more notes than time. This is our time to mark our progress. You see, this was not a stop sign for these people. This was a mile marker for where God had brought them. This, he was saying in their life and in their heart, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you uh, w uh, the progress that you made. In a day's time, he turned them from a defeated people into a victorious people. He turned them from slaves into people that lived in freedom. He turned them from somebody who couldn't see, seemingly find their way out of their own situations and circumstance. But God said, I want you to know because you, because you decided to follow me, because you decided... To, to be revealed, uh, to be revealed uh, in, in my service. He said, I want you to notice that this will mark your progress. I'm not talking about any kind of progress. I'm talking about real progress. What is real progress, Derek? Is it a church full of people? No. Is it, is it, is it, is it uh, success b b the way the world knows it? No. Real progress was when people repent when people cry out to a living God, where people say, Lord, change my life, change my heart, change my mind. On that battlefield, real progress happened. On that battlefield, they, they, they begin to cry out to a living God and God sent them a message. Don't worry about the enemy. I'll take care of them. You just take care of your heart. You just take care of following me and, and giving yourself to me. He said, this is a mark of real progress in our lives and in our hearts. Oh, I am so thankful that our Lord and our God has given us an Ebenezer that simply says, you are making a way. See, we need to remember, some of us need to remember where we came from. The sin that was in our life. Some of us need to remember what it was like to live without him. Some of us need to remember what it was like to do our own thing. They knew what it was like to do their own thing. And they found themselves defeated and crushed. But then, there's, but then we need to look back and just see how far God has brought us. Oh, there's an old song I used to sing that, that went like this. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where, tell me where would I be? You see, and we need those Ebenezer moments. We need those times when we look back, not to, not to celebrate the sin, but we look back and say, thank you, God, that I'm not living like that anymore. Thank you, Lord God, that my life is not being just devastated by the, the sin in my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, as we mark the progress that God has for our lives. And then it was a time... A promise. I, I included verse 13 simply because I believe that it is a result of the, of, of the Ebenezer moment. It read like this. So the Philistines were subdued. They did not come anymore into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. You see, he wanted them to realize something. That when you have Ebenezer moments where you pause to recognize him. Where you pause to recognize him as your help, as your strength, as your rock. That something can, will take place in your life. And that is, he will open new ground to you. He'll open new territory to you. He'll show you that what the enemy has taken, you can claim back and you can bring, you can, you can grab a hold to. Why? Because he wants you to just pause long enough to realize 
whose you are. He wants you to realize what you are. He wants you to realize your role in the kingdom of God and, and in your plan. So when we begin to make him our Ebenezer, uh, when we begin to make him our Lord, we can stop and say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Here I am, Lord. Teach me. Here I am, Lord. Be with me and guide me. Now, throughout the word of God, there is what is known as symbolic gestures. How many of you know that God doesn't need a memorial? God doesn't need anything to remind him who he is. He knows without a shadow of a doubt his faithfulness. He knows without a shadow of a doubt his immutability. He knows with a shadow of a doubt who he is and what he is in, in, in your life. But he wants us to realize that those memorials are there for us. Those are more memorials are there that every time we pass by it, every time we think about it, every time we cross that its path, that we'll look over and say, yes, it's still true. My God is my Ebenezer. My God is my rock. And this morning, I'm going to ask you, will you join me for a symbolic gesture this morning? Will you mark this day and say with this inaugural pastor, yes, this crazy, spitting, insane guy that you voted in, <laughs> would you say with me today, Lord, I mark who you are in my life. I mark who you are in this church. I mark who you are, Lord God, in this place. I've heard the stories of how the doors were cl almost closed. I've heard the stories how there was more bill than, than, than finances. I've heard the story how many people no doubt wrote you off and said, no, it's not going to happen. But every time we hear those stories now, we can say, you know, I've heard it, but I know that he has the final say in everything that we do and everything that we are. And I want to serve the Ebenezer in my life. If you're in this house this morning and you're under no obligation, under no pressure at all. And if you say, Derek, I want to mark this Ebenezer. I believe it's important in my life, in my heart, that I recognize who he is and what he is. I want you to just stand to your feet at this moment and say, I want to join you as a pastor. I want to join you as a church. I want to join you and say, Lord God, today is our Ebenezer. Today is the day, Lord God, that we look back and see where you brought us from. <laughs> that you look, Lord, that we see, Lord Jesus, what you're going to do in our future, God. We with confidence step into tomorrow because we've already walked with you yesterday. We with confidence step into our future knowing, Lord Jesus, that you have everything under control because you are faithful, Lord God. And as we follow you, we'll be a part of what you're doing. Thank you this morning. Thank you this morning for joining me this morning. Oh, our God is our rock we're gonna follow him church if you're following me and I want to warn you there's somebody ahead of me there's somebody's leading there's somebody's guiding I want to live like Paul lived where he says follow me as I follow Christ when you see this boy deviating from that plan you deviate too and you and you find you somebody else uh, you know but I want to follow him why because I know he is the only key to be in what God wants to be in our life. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh, Father, we recognize you this very day, Lord God. If it hadn't been for you, Lord God, where will we be, Lord God? Lord, we this very day as a church, as individuals, as people, Lord God. Oh, Lord God, we declare oh, to you, we declare uh, to, even in the voice, in the ears of our enemies, we declare. You are our Ebenezer, Lord God. Oh, Lord Jesus, and we mark this day. May we look back on this day and say, I remember the day. When we declared him as our Ebenezer. I remember the day when we looked back and we saw what he's brought us from. What he's bringing us to. And how, he, how we can rely and we can trust on him. 
Oh, I want to experience you, Lord God. Here I am, Lord Jesus. Here I am, Lord God. And just like the children of Israel, who when they saw you move, Lord God, they begin to move. They begin to act. They begin to obey as well, Lord God. Anoint us, Lord Jesus, as we step into tomorrow, as we step into our future as a people, as we step into our future as a church, Lord God, that we would step with the confidence that you are the faithful one, that you are leading us and you're guiding us and you're helping us Lord God along the way oh in Jesus glorious name we ask it we pray Lord Jesus etch it upon our hearts Lord God may we be walking talking memorials to a living God in this place in Jesus name we ask it and the church said amen amen God bless you thank you for coming we appreciate you being here this morning on this old boy's inaugural Sunday we hope to see you again and again and again amen God bless you